Good morning. Greet each one in Christ's precious name this morning. Thank you, Elliot, for those songs. Often amazed how God, in his knowing, all-knowingness, um, leads people to uh, think in the same pathways, I guess. And uh, this morning, the songs that Elliot picked out fit very well with the message I uh, have felt led to preach, uh, thinking of refuge, and, and I was going to try to memorize some of the, 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 the lines that we sang this morning, because they were powerful, God being our rock and our refuge, and, but I, they've, they've escaped me already, so, but you're, the things that we sang this morning, I think, fit very well this morning with the message that God has led me to preach. And that is about suffering, and it's about persecution. And uh, I, I was troubled because I don't feel like I, I don't know anything about persecution, really. We, maybe we as a, as a whole, as a country even, don't really know what that all means. And as I was sitting there, I thought, Maybe there's one person, Ryan Hilda, may know more about this than all of us combined. But um, a couple weeks ago in our Sunday school lesson, we had this verse, and it it stirred within me it, uh, to consider what 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 is God talking to us about? Um, let me turn this on. It said, "Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though." Something strange is happening to you or unto you. Don't be taken aback. Don't be surprised about the, the, the ordeal that you're going to go through that's coming into your life. That's what Peter's saying here. I don't know what that stirs up in you when you, when you think of that, when you consider that. Don't, don't be taken aback by the fiery trial that's going to that's gonna come into your life. What's God pre- preparing? What was Peter, what was God through Peter? And even today as we study God's word, what's he preparing us for? It, it seems so vague and so far out there. And yet we sing songs like this morning. We think, yes, Lord. And I think what, the reason that I struggled with coming to grips with this message was because I don't feel like I suffer. I don't suffer persecution. Not like some do. Not like... Like we read about in the scripture, that the, that First Peter goes on and says, "But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye." I don't I don't know what that partaking in Christ's suffering all all entails. But I was encouraged this week as I was studying. I, I did preach a similar message. It wasn't any, this one is actually quite a bit different from what I preached last week at, at Elkhart. It was also about um, persecution and suffering. I used some of the same scriptures. But as I was studying over the week, the past couple weeks, and thinking about this message, things that came into my email or things that came into my uh, things that we talked about, or even this morning singing songs about refuge just seem to validate that this is, this is where God wants me to be this morning, and I appreciate that. Here a couple days ago, I, I received an email from uh, Pablo Yoder in Nicaragua. He puts out an email newsletter-y type thing, that, and the first lines that he, that he, that he wrote was kind of a, almost like a poem uh, and he was talking about the wind chime that was hanging uh, outside his house. And uh, it was just hanging there noiseless. There was no breeze. It wasn't moving. Nothing was happening. But the storm was coming. And as the winds began to blow and the, and the, the wind chime started sounding, and, and the harder it blew, the louder it, the louder it chimed. That was the idea that he had in his... He said it much more nicer than that, but... I just, I thought, you know, 
the troubles of life, that's when God wants us to shine the brightest, when we're in the, in the darkest times of our life. And that's when the wind chime chimes the loudest, when it's the stormiest time of life. Yesterday, I was with my Uncle Dennis Troyer, and uh, we were driving uh, through the countryside, and, and we noticed the corn. You farmers, John, you may notice the corn is like, was sticking straight up. It wasn't corn, you know, like leaf. It was always just straight up. He says, look at that corn. It's straight up. All the leaves were pointing straight up to the sky. He says, and then when it's dry and, and times are hard, it curls up. Isn't, isn't that amazing? He, this is my Uncle Dennis talking. He said, it's just, like, it's just like persecuted Christians. I thought, whoa, God, I'm thinking about this. And here you bring this, right? He says, just like persecuted Christians. When times get really hard, we just, we just we draw in and, and protect ourselves. Just like the corn. And then when times are good, we raise our hands towards heaven and we worship. I thought, yeah, that is the way it is. And so this morning, I don't know what God has for this message, but that's what we're going to talk about, suffering for the gospel. And may God use the message to encourage your heart and however that may come and maybe encourage us as we face what could happen in our lifetime. 1 Timothy 3.12 says this, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, all shall suffer persecution. I don't know what that all means. I don't know. There, I'm sure there are varying degrees of that. But that's, that's the idea that I'm coming to you with today is that we all shall suffer some sort of persecution, some sort of opposition. I've titled my message, Faithfulness in the Face of Opposition. And that opposition can be in various ways. And we may have already, you may have already in your life, you, may can, you might be right now thinking of something that's happened to you and say, you know, I know what, that's, I know what that is. I've had that opposition. Even as a, an Amer a North American, we faced it. But I'm going to use the word uh, for a, a little bit here yet, the, the idea of persecution. When I think of persecution, what my mind goes to is, is physical, bodily harm or danger. And so as we think of that just for a moment, because I think that was Peter and Christ were thinking of those very things when they were speaking this, as well as the other things as well, the, the less um, intrusive I was thinking, you know, I, I struggle to focus on persecution because we we're not familiar with that. But maybe we should because it is, it could very well um, become real to us at some point. 30% of the world, 30% of the people in the world, the population of the world identifies as Christian. I, I assumed it would be more than that, but only 30%. And yet Christianity is the largest people group of religious group in the world more Christians than any other religion, and yet only 30% of the world identifies as Christian. Of, of, so I, I imagine a pie, a, a graph, you know, like a, a pie, there'd be a small sliver of a pie that people identify as Christian. Seventy percent of the graph would be a different color because they don't they identify as Muslim or Hindu or something, some other religion. 30% of the, of the population identifies as Christian, but 80%, 80% of all religiously motivated violence or oppression is suffered by Christians. 80% of the violence is towards Christians. 90% of the people killed for their faith, killed on the basis of their religion, are Christians. They're only 30% of the world's population, and yet they suffer 80 to 90% of the violence. And these Christians, many of them in, in, in Asia and in, in the Middle East and Europe and places like that, that we don't, we're not familiar with this. They, these Christians suffer discrimination in many areas, social discrimination where pressure from their peers, they, they, be, they, they, they accept Christ as their savior and yet all the people around them, pressure from their peers, social pressure, 
pressure them to leave and forsake Christ. They, they suffer institutional dis discrimination where the government requires them to have permits, but the government prevents them from getting permit because they're Christian. Institutional discrimination, employment discrimination, legal discrimination, not being able to get fair representation because they're Christians, suppression of missionary efforts, and suppression of conversions. I, I looked at that one, and, and they do this via the law. They, they do it via blasphemy or apostasy laws, such as the infamous Pakistani law, Law 295 is what it's called. And I, I looked that one up. This was actually referred to in an email that I received from, from the Voices of the Martyrs, um, newsletter, and it referred to the Pakistani Law 295, and I looked that one up. It's in 1986. So this is how they suppress missionary work and, and, and people that want to come to Christ, but they, they know about this law. In 1986, via the Criminal Law Amendment Act, they added to Section 295C, to the, they added that section to the, to the Pakistani Penal Code, and this allows them to provide the death penalty or life imprisonment for the criminal offense of defiling the name of pro the Prophet Muhammad. So imagine a new Christian come, comes to, to the faith and then they, they come and they question him out. And they, they question his faith and they say, well, what about Muhammad? And he says, well, I believe in Christ now. And then they call that you're, 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 you're um, defiling the name of Muhammad and therefore you can have life of imprisonment or death. That's how they go about to, to, to suppress conversions. I remember in the, back in the early 2000s when we had the, the, war of, the war against terror, if you remember that time. Uh, and and they, they had the term radical Islam that had to be stopped. That radical Islam was the fault of all this. And um, what alarmed me was that there were times when they, 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 they used the, just the term radical religious, and even occasionally you would hear radical Christianity during that time. And they had the idea, they, 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 they represented it as though anything radical was bad. But if you're sold out for Christ, if, you're, if I will not bend, I will not bow, and you're sold out for Christ, then being a radical Christian is a good thing. And yet they would want to call it bad. Radical, conservative ideology. And we're, we are close here, here even in the United States. Not too far removed where being a radical Christian, the ideology that a radical Christian is, is a negative thing or a bad thing, we're not too far from, removed from that. Pakistani Christians in, in the, the Voices of the Martyrs, they, they were saying that, that Christians in Pakistan where co-workers and families and communities are, are violent, violently opposed to those that leave Islam and follow Christ. There's only 2% of the people there that are Christian. And this is what they said about their life. Just thinking about how, how, how does suffering for Christ look like today and maybe in other parts of the world. They're trapped in a cycle of limited educational opportunities and poverty. Many remain in the lowest levels of society throughout their lives, performing labor-intensive menial work like brick kiln workers or sewer cleaners or street sweepers. When they share the gospel or talk about their Christian faith, they are sometimes falsely charged with blaspheming Islam or Muhammad or the Koran. And convictions can result in harsh prison sentences, even the death penalty under Pakistan's Law 295. That's happening in the world today. Not just in Pakistan, but other places in the world where this happens. And they suppress the gospel that way. Their suppression of corporate worship, storming into house churches in China and we, we know of that happening in years ago in, in, in the communist Russia and Romania and places like that, where they storm into house, house churches and, and arrest those that are there. There's violence, there's community oppression, where entire communities oppress a Christian family or a Christian group. Together, they corporately oppress 
a group of believers. Those things are happening today. So violence and persecution, as it's mentioned in the scripture, is, is true for some. In North, America, uh, in North America, not so much. But it's true for some. There are other types of oppression and opposition, and that's what we'd like to look at a little bit today yet as well. What are we, what should we be prepared? What is God preparing us to face in the form of opposition? When, when will we need Christ to be our refuge to run into? Psalm 34 says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. We must depend on the Lord. He is our refuge and our strength. Persecution. Remaining with that word for just a, a, a bit longer. Persecution is opposition fueled by the enemy. The enemy wants to suppress any kind of spreading of the gospel. So he, he brings opposition via governments, people, whatever it may be, to, to resist the work, of, the work that God is doing, to, to attempt to stop the truth from being spread, to, 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 to end revival, to discourage the, discourage the Christian, and to instill fear into the Christian. And talking of this fear, Matthew says this, Matthew 10, 28, and fear them not, which kill the body. Those are the persecutors. Fear them not which can kill the, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, God, which is able to destroy both body, soul and body in hell. When we live out our faith in spite of opposition, when we live out our faith, when we love like Christ taught us to love, and we, we do good works in spite of the opposition. It, it brings a powerful testimony. It, they, people are convicted by those kinds of lives. And we're instructed in, in the, right after the Beatitudes, Jesus said this, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. They can see you living out what you've been taught and glorify your, God, your Father which is in heaven. They glorify God in that process living for God, loving like God wants us to, can stir up opposition. That's what he said in the Beatitudes. He said, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. They're persecuted because they are righteous. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Continuing with the beatitude line here. If physical persecution is rare, then what kinds of opposition do we face? He goes on there and says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. That's another form of, a, of op opposition and, 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 and persecution. And persecute you. And she'll say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. They revile you. That can be, maybe that is one of the ways that we face this opposition. How are we going to remain faithful in the face of opposition when people revile us? They revile us, that means to defame, to rail at us to criticize in an abusive or angry, insulting manner. Verbally cutting, verbally defaming us. Def the defaming part can be behind our back. We may not even realize it. They're spreading misinformation, assumptions. and ex Maybe they're exaggerating a weakness that we have and they're defaming you behind your back. They're reviling you because you, you are a Christian and they, they despise that. Often the defaming happens in our circle of friends. Maybe it's not our inner circle, but it's the circle, the next circle out. They, they, they're talking. Did you hear? Did you hear about what they did? Did you, did you know? Things like that, where they, where they defame us. They, they attack our character. 
They attack who you are. And unfortunately, this can happen inside the church. Friends, we need to be careful that we are not the ones that are persecuting those that are trying to live righteously. We think that persecution would come from the outside, but sometimes it comes from within. I'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 10. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Matthew chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. Verse 16. He's instructing them. Just He's ready to send them out. And as we consider this, let's consider it for our own lives. Jesus sending out his disciples, and it's not a flowery, you guys are great, just go take on the world. Listen to what he tells them. Verse 16 of chapter 10, Matthew. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. In their synagogues. That's the religious places. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought of what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall, shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the child shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye to another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. What a, what a sending off. They're going to persecute you guys. Be ready. Verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. Here the Prince of Peace. The, the one that gives us a peace that passeth all understanding says this. Think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. For he that, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. That's the life of a committed Christian. It's hard. It can be hard. It's blessed as well. And we have a refuge. And, and Jesus delivers us from them all. We, we saw that in, in, in that psalm. The many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. But there will be afflictions. There will be those that come, and in their persecution, they think they're doing God a service. That's what it says in John. It says, it says in John, they shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doth God a service. They think in their persecuting, they're doing God a service. This, but in reality, they're, they're going against God. Luke 6, the same scripture that was, this was Luke's perspective of what Jesus was saying in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when, when men shall hate you. And when they shall separate you from their company, and they shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Reproach you. This word reproach is the same word as revile. Exact same word in the Greek. They reproach you and they cast out your name. To defame you, they cast out your name. In 1 Peter 4.14, 4, we... we uh, we had this recently in our Sunday school lesson. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of God, the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. 
And notice, notice the response that we're supposed to have. When they reproach your name, when, you, when you're reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. You're to be happy. In, in, um, in Luke, it said, when it looks as when they hate you and, and cast out your name as evil, it says, rejoice ye in that day. Leap for joy. In, in Matthew, it said, be exceeding glad. Our natural response is to do exactly the opposite. To be distressed, to be, to be stressed out, to be bitter. Why? But he, God wants us to be rejoicing when, when it's for... And I think the key here is when we're suffering for Christ's sake versus suffering for something that we've done. And that's what I'd like to this morning as we think about suffering for Christ. I think the lens that we need to focus on our, on our camera lens to zoom in and to realize that we need to adjust our focus so that we are blurred out and the focus is solely on Christ. Christ is focused and we're focused out. I think too many times when we have those feelings of bitterness and, 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 and frustrated with, the, with what the hardness of life or what someone is saying or if we are being persecuted, why it's so hard to love our persecutor is because our focus is on me instead of on Christ. We do good. We live above reproach. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We love our enemies, not by default because we're, we're Mennonite Christians, no, because that's what God's purpose is for us in life. We live intentionally to, to glorify God, to promote his kingdom. And then when our conversation, our life, we have our life, our conversation honest among the Gentiles, that when they speak, when they speak of us as evildoers, Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, they'll see that, they'll glorify God in the day of visitation. That's how we should live on purpose. But when we, when we experience opposition, when we experience persecution of whatever fashion that may be, we need to do a quick examination of ourselves. Am I experiencing opposition? opposition, if people are resisting me, is it because of flaws in my character or have I done something whereby they've been offended? This should not bring joy if that's the case, but it should bring repentance. And God's Spirit is faithful. He's working on us at the same time He's working on them to rough off those, to, to, to knock off those rough edges And if the reproach is because I'm a Christian, that's purely why the, the reproach is. I've examined my moti- motives. I'm, living, I'm not living in a haphazard way. I'm living on purpose. I'm connected to the vine. I'm living out my salvation with fear and trembling. And the reproach is because Christ is in me. Then I can rejoice. Then I rejoice. Then I leap for joy. As I was studying, I found this thinking of the reproach of uh, the pro- reproach of Christ. Whereas Jesus also, this is in Hebrews 3, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And then it says, let us therefore, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. And that's what, that's what, that's what, when we suffer for the name of Christ, that's what we're doing. We're, we're bearing the reproach of Christ like we're supposed to. But let's be careful. Let's be in constant, humble connection with our Savior that it's not our own righteousness. It's not our own good works that brings this reproach. We don't rejoice rejoice because we're good. No, it's because Christ in us. That's why we bear reproach and that's why we can rejoice. I find it interesting here. It says that, let us therefore go unto him without the camp. I don't like that. It's outside, the, it's outside my comfort zone. But as I thought about this, it's not amongst the in crowd anymore. It's outside the camp. It's outside the, the religious, the self-righteous, the pharisaical crowd. Those are all back in camp. And we're going outside the camp to bear the reproach of Christ. 
outside of the place. When you're amongst the, uh, the same kind of people, it's the safe place to practice your religion. But we're supposed to step out of that safe place to practice our, into the world to practice our religion, our belief. That being said, it's not meant that we avoid going to church. It's not, that's not the camp. It should mean that all of us that are worshiping here today are outside of the camp. And we're, we're doing this from hearts that are, that, are, that are driven to serving the Lord as we ought to. We're aware of the dangers. We've examined our purpose and our focus regularly. Missions and outreach, lost people serving are things that are on the front burners in our lives and in our minds. We're a church that is outside the camp. If we find busyness or business or the cares of this world or just living to be taking priority in our lives, then it's time that we reevaluate and be serious about serving the Lord. In Matthew, it said, they persecute you, they, they revile you, and they say all manner of evil against you. That's another form of persecution. They say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. This is again the, the Luke 6 verse. They, they separate you. They purposely exclude you from, from their gatherings or from their, their social activities. They reproach you. They, they cast out your name as evil. Don't, 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 don't associate with her because, you know, she's, that's the kind of language they use. They, iso- they bully to try to isolate you away. How do we combat that? How do, we, how, do we, how do we deal with that as Christians? I have two points this morning that I'd like to bring. 1 Peter 2.19 says that, that, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. The key to me here is that suffering wrongfully. If we suffer, but it's wrongfully, it should not be. That's the key. And that's where we need to have that constant connection with, with God to know, am I suffering wrongfully or am I, am I suffering because of something I said or that I did? did? Did my flesh cause me to use a tone or did my lips utter words or my expression show signs of something that was offensive and it was not from Christ, it was not loving? Then if that's the case, then I'm not suffering wrongfully and I need to go make that right. Is it always the enemy that brings opposition? I tried to emphasize this morning that we need to be connected to, to God enough that we know whether it's the enemy or, or is it God checking our motives and our, our, our hearts? God's grace can, bring, can use opposition to bring us back into a place, uh, back into a line, a line with his purposes. Maybe we've gotten into a bad place. Maybe we're maybe by through negligence or complacency we've gotten to a bad place, a bad state, and he wants to bring us back into maybe it's pride or anger that's gotten us there, but he wants to bring us back. Two points this morning of how God how we can face opposition and remain faithful. Faithfully faithfulness in the in the face of opposition. Humility and full commitment. I'd like to just briefly speak on both of those points. God God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. We know we're familiar with that. And so this morning as we face opposition, a face opposition to our faith, face opposition for being a Christian, then we need to have humility because God gives us grace when we're humble. Proverbs says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. When that, when that opposition comes, are we, are we there with a soft answer? Humble answer. Thinking on, on humility, it, turn with me to, to 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 11. This is a story of Rehoboam. I'd like to go to 2 Chronicles 11 and 12. And we're just going to do a 
kind of a flyover of this story of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. He's taken over the, um, the kingdom. And um, he was the one. I believe he was the one that, um, that it went to the, to the older men and they said, you know, deal, deal wisely and kindly with the people. And the young men said, his peers said, no, deal harshly. And he took the, the, the way of the, uh, of the younger people and was, was dealing harshly, if I'm not mistaken here. I, this, that, was not, that was not part of my study here. In, in chapter 11, when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered, out of the, he gathered of the house of Judah and Benjamin, Excuse me. And hundred and fourscore thousand cho- uh, chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against Israel. So, he, what happens here is Rehoboam is going to go against the, his brethren, I- Israel, and they're going to attack them. And, and br- he wants to put the kingdom back together again. There's two kingdoms now: Judah and Israel. And he wants to 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 go to battle. But it says in verse two, "But the word of the Lord came to." Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus saith the Lord, you shall not go up, and nor shall you fight against your brethren. God said, Don't do this. And he didn't. But he started strengthening his cities. And we read throughout here that he strengthened his cities, he fortified the strongholds. And Rehoboam, at the end of chapter 11 here, it says he had many wives. And, and, and in the end of chapter 11, you read here in the scripture, and he desired many wives. He was, a, he was a sensual man. That was Rehoboam. Jeroboam over in Israel. Anyway, Rehoboam, so he didn't attack Jeroboam. And he was a very central man, desired many wives. In chapter 12, it says, And it came to pass, when, when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of God, the, the law of the Lord, and all of Israel with him. And it came to pass in the fifth year of the king of Rehoboam. He's only been there five years. You think maybe this has been a long time, but it's only been five years. And he has decided in those five years he was going to attack Israel. God said, don't. He's fortified his cities. He's, he's become a very central person. And in five years, he's forsaken the law of the Lord and all, all Israel with him. And God, it says it came, and then, then Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Israel because they had transgressed against the Lord. 1,200 chariots, three score thousand, 60,000 horsemen, and people without number. There was a, an army coming across the land. As far as you could see, there were people. And they were going through the cities that were fortified. He had fortified these cities and they were just crushing them. And now they were up against, and they, were to, they come to Jerusalem. In verse 4 of chapter 12, And he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah the prophet. He came back to, to Rehoboam and he said, Rehoboam, the princes of Judah... The prophet to Rehoboam and to, excuse me, chapter, verse 5. Then came Shemaiah, the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak, the Egyptian. And they said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, ye have forsaken me, and therefore I have, I have also left you in the hand of Shishak. That was their punishment. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves. This is my point. They humbled themselves. And they said, the Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, and the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, they have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them. And I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. When opposition comes, we we must, must humble ourselves. Rehoboam did that. And the Lord stayed 
the harshness that was coming for him. God notices the humble heart. He gives grace to a humble heart. If he has brought opposition in my life, he just may stay that opposition if I'm humble before him. If not, his grace will be not his grace will not come. If I do not humble myself, then his grace will not be there to help me through. And even if it is not stayed, his grace will be with me if I'm humble, and he will help me through it. Critical, critical point is that we must remain humble. And we must have a full commitment. Am I fully committed to the cause of Christ? Am I fully committed to following after Christ? Total surrender. Nothing is being held back. What does that look like? It may mean that I will suffer for my faith. Am I fully committed? In 1 Peter 4.16 it says this, If a man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf, on this behalf. Don't be ashamed. In, in Acts chapter 5, the disciples had been preaching the gospel and healing, and, and, and the religious men, the Pharisees, brought them together, the Sadducees, they brought them together, and they, they, they instructed them not to do this anymore, threw them into prison. And in verse 40, it says, they, when they were brought before the council, it says, and when they, had, when they had called the apostles and beaten them, I had to imagine in my mind all these religious men in their robes with sticks beating the apostles. They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. If you're suffering persecution of any sort for being a Christian, don't be ashamed. Romans, powerful verse. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. When you, when you believe in something, when you, when you know without a doubt that this is the way, that this is the truth, when you believe in a cause and you're convinced, then you're not ashamed to stand for that. You're not even ashamed to, to face the opposition because you're committed. You're committed to the cause. When, you're, when we're committed, a lot of things enter in. How do I do that? Do I, do I die daily? Do I, do, I, do I take up my cross daily? Those, those kinds of things are always indicators of my level of commitment. I love the way Joshua, in Joshua 24, he says this in verse 15, If it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites which are in the land you dwell. But... As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was committed 